Good evening, black people and all allies fighting for black liberation, black prosperity, and black joy. I'm Charles Blow, and welcome to Prime. Russian military forces in Ukraine sit waves of fear around the globe with their attack on and seizure of Europe's largest nuclear plant. Just hours ago, the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine released a statement calling the attack a war crime. Energy officials from several countries warned that Russia's brazen attack on the nuclear plant could have led to radiation leaks that would have had severe consequences for Ukrainians and possibly citizens of neighboring countries. While Russian forces have gained control of the nuclear plant, Ukrainian workers are still running the plants, and according to some reports, they are doing so at gunpoint. Following a call from Ukraine's president, President Biden requested that the U.S. Department of Energy activate its incident response team in case of a nuclear incident. The Kremlin should immediately cease all attacks around Ukrainian nuclear facilities and allow civilian personnel to do their work to ensure the facility's safety and security as both the IAEA uh, Director General and a resolution adopted yesterday by the agency's Board of Governors have called on Russia to do. Meanwhile, in Russia... Their parliament passed laws aimed at controlling the media narrative about the invasion, which the White House press secretary addressed during today's briefing. There are concerning uh, steps they have taken um, to crack down on any form of information being shared with the Republic. Certainly Facebook is a part of that. They've also threatened fines uh, for journalists reporting on the ground. They've threatened, uh, they've conveyed that there are only certain words their own Russian media can use uh, at the risk of being fined or even jailed. The White House has also announced that Vice President Kamala Harris will travel to Poland early next week to show support for Ukraine and NATO allies. Joining us to discuss is former H, uh, FBI double agent and Newsweek's editor-at-large, Naveed Jamali. So, Naveed, just before we came on air, CNN had breaking news that Russia was preparing to send another 1,000 mercenaries into Ukraine. I think the effort uh, by is seen by many as an attempt to uh, just basically break Ukraine. What do you make of this idea that, that you know, that the, the fighting has not ceased in any way? In fact, the intensity of the Russian attack has only increased. So here's the good news, is I think that while it is, look, very, very likely at this point that the Russians will seize Kiev, and that is clearly uh, Putin's tactical objective. The reality is that, as we've seen, Zelensky has thus far, I mean, look, he's rallied the Ukrainian people. The Ukrainian military is still is still functioning. Um, and as long as Zelensky remains the president of Ukraine, uh, Putin will not achieve his strategic goals, whether he sends a thousand mercenaries or not, um, whether he sends more troops. The reality is as long as uh, President Zelensky stays in power, um, an independent Ukraine will exist. And I just don't see that uh, Putin is going to be successful in that, even though he is unleashing really just horrible acts against the, the country of Ukraine and its people. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, Zelensky. He's expected to have a call with a few senators tomorrow. What do you expect to come from that call? Uh, and, and how could that affect the, uh, the American positioning? Because the White House has made its position relatively, uh, not relatively clear, absolutely clear that they're not going yeah. to engage militarily on the ground. I suspect that Zelensky is going to do what he has done uh, for the last few days, which is continue to press for a no-fly zone. Of course, uh, NATO today uh, rejected uh, such an option, and as the U.S. did before that. So, look, uh, Zelensky is going to probably ask for lethal aid, that is to say military weapons, um, and of course a no-fly zone. But the reality, Charles, is as the president has said, and, and as NATO has made very clear, you know, to put American or NATO aircraft over the skies of Ukraine, even though it's Ukrainian airspace, would put them into direct conflict with Russian aircraft. And that would invariably lead to direct confrontation and potentially escalation and, in fact, war. And so it's just not going to happen. But, and I don't know what that leaves Zelensky with other than asking for aid and, and other perhaps, you know, covert action support for him. Let's ask, let me ask a little bit more about the no fly zone. Is putting aircraft in the air the only way to achieve that or is there any way to do that remotely it still has the same effect right you end up sure. if if russian planes violated you'd have to shoot them down that would all that would that would by definition be a direct 
interaction between the NATO and or the U.S. and Russia. They don't want that. But is having actual planes the only way to do that, or can you do it real, remotely? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. And there's always an option B. And look, the, the history of the United States is laden with efforts that are essentially military action conducted by the CIA, which is a totally different thing. That's when I say covert action. So it is, we have a long history, look, the Bay of Pigs in Cuba, which was of course a failed attempt to invade the country. Uh, the first American forces into Afghanistan after September 11th were in fact the CIA. So is it possible that drones, so unmanned pilotless vehicles could in fact be deployed by another agency other than the Department of Defense? It's something we've reported on Look, uh, we know the, the uh, Ukrainians have Turkish drones. We don't know who's flying them. So, Charles, there is, as I suspect, and I've been saying this, I, I think what we're going to see here is a lot of what's known as covert action, which is to say, essentially, there may be American forces, but they will not be acting under the sort of boots on ground DOD definition. They'll be working for someone like the CIA. And of course, this is me speculating, but history would indicate that in times like this, the CIA has been incredibly active in these types of events. Let's dig a little bit more to that murkiness. So if Zelensky is going to, as you say, probably asking for more weapons, say the U.S. gives him drones. Uh, uh, if a U.S. drone is controlling airspace and shooting down Russian uh, uh, planes or whatever, could the Russians see that as an act of war by the U.S. itself? They're remote in yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, right. So it, it, it's, if a drone with U.S. markings is shot down or detected by the Russians, you're absolutely right, Charles. The Russians would view that as incredibly provocative. But look, we're giving the Ukrainians Rush, uh, American weapons, right? And the Russians don't know who's firing those weapons. So my position here is that with drones, you know, you can take a drone, you can say, hey, this is, we've gifted this to the Ukrainians. And when it's shot down, who's to say who's piloting it? So there is this murkiness, in your words, um, that exists in this type of operation that I think allows someone like the CIA to come in and to essentially have plausible deniability. So to operate in a way that if they are detected, it's hard for the Russians to say specifically who was behind that operation, who was behind that attack. Look, that convoy has stalled. Who's to say, you know, who's the actual people behind stalling it? We don't know. There very well may be other forces at play in right. Ukraine, and we're just not going to talk about it. So that is, you know, and again, going with history, you know, from Afghanistan to to a long way back, you know, we've had the CIA that has been oftentimes the first to go into these countries and to operate right. um, in a kinetic way, and again, under using plausible deniability. And how exactly are more weapons and munitions able to get into Ukraine without <laughs> Western boots being on the ground to get it into Ukraine. Russia is basically choking off access to the to the water. It is a small area where they do not control at this point. There is not, other than that, there is the Western Front, which is clogged full of uh, refugees trying to get out of Ukraine. How do the, how do those weapons get in, and how do they escape being targeted by the Russians as soon as they see something that looks funny? Uh, on a satellite image. Yeah, that's, a, that's again, this is a very good question. I mean, so the, all the pontification and proclamations where Western, you know, the United States and NATO and, and Western Europe are promising all this aid, you're absolutely right to ask, how is it actually getting to the hands of Ukrainian soldiers? That's a very, very good question. So saying you're going to give military aid and bringing it to the border, that's, that's only part of the equation. You've got to actually get it to the Ukrainians. And you're right. Right now, let's be honest, the Russians have air superiority over Ukraine. Uh, you know, the Ukrainian Air Force may be still intact, but it's not flying. So you can't fly those weapons in. So you got to go over land. And, and you're absolutely right. The Russians can see this stuff. So I, I'm really skeptical. I have to be honest that, you know, we're going to see this mass amount of stuff getting into Ukraine simply because it's a very difficult proposition. Yet, you know, we have those commitments. And again, it goes back to my my idea here that there's going to have to be some covert stuff going on to get this stuff in here. Or otherwise, it's going to be like a convoy like we're seeing going towards Kev, just a line of, you know, Western trucks driving into Ukraine to drop off arms. And of course, the, the Russians are going to pick that off. I mean, got to have some level of, you know, right. ability to camouflage this stuff. Naveed Jamali, thank you as always for your time, sir. I really appreciate it.